Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 11 today, and we've been in a new sermon series called... Walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And that shadow of death really, at times for us, does represent the world in which we live. Life can be really tough, especially in light of recent news, tragedies occurring, bad things happening. Sometimes this world can feel like you are literally walking through the shadow of death. But notice what David says, I will fear no evil. Why? God, you are with me. And we know as long as God is with us, we can take whatever this world throws at us. You know, as a young man, I always did a lot of stupid things, uh, like a lot of young guys do. Let me hurt myself for no apparent reason, because it's funny. And so we do, we do really dumb stuff. When I was 12 years old, we had this really big slip and slide in the back of our yard that we created out of our own tarps. And so, you know, we lived uh, in this community. We had a really big backyard. And the entire backyard was on a slope. So when it came to sled riding or summertime with the tarps, we, we would have a blast. Well, we were constructing this backyard slip and slide, and we were connecting the tarps together. At that time, they really didn't have like big, long rolls of plastic like they do today. So we had to overlap them. And I couldn't find any stakes or anything, so I got the bright idea. I will go to the kitchen, and I will get a bunch of knives. Yes, and I would use the knives to hold the tarp in place as I would stab each corner. Well, I had already been outside playing for a while, and I was all wet. I still, I still remember this to this day. And so I grab the knife, and I go to shove it in the ground. Of course, I want to give some force, and my hand's wet, and so it slips, and I still have the scar on my pinky finger. Cut my finger right open, and we're talking like a nice big gash. I've done stuff like this all the time. A few summers ago, I decided to use a knife as a screwdriver. And so knives fold open, but they also fold shut. And so here I am, and the, 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 the screw is stuck. And so I'm pressing really hard. Sure enough, before you know it, clamp right down on my finger. It was actually this finger, and I still had the scar right there. When I was 11 years old, I was playing in our community with a friend who was in high school. And he was calling me names because I was chubbier when I was younger, you know, it just happens. And so he called me a really bad name and I went into like berserker mode. I grabbed a hammer and I began to chase him around the backyard and he's running from me. Well, he actually runs into my house and as he's going through the door, I extend my arm to follow through to hit him and he goes through and slams the door on my hand Well, the door is made out of glass. And so it cut my arm and I still have the scar. I've got scars all over my body from doing really stupid stuff. I think one of the reasons why this is called the shadow of death is because sometimes, often, we do a lot of things that cause us our own pain. We buy houses we can't afford. We go to places we shouldn't go. We say things we have no business saying, things that we don't mean out of anger. We do a lot of things that cause us our own pain. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy. But there are other times when these events and situations are thrust on us. We contact things like diseases. We get deformities. We have death. And so even though we walk through this valley of the shadow of death, we do things that hurt ourselves all the time. There are sometimes situations that are thrust upon us out of our control. Well, how do we handle situations with suffering, with death, with pain in this magnitude that really change the course of our life? Well, that's what we're going to talk about here in John chapter 11. In John chapter 10, John is all about theology. His whole point of the book of John is to prove two things. Number one, Jesus is the son of God. And number two, you've got good reasons to believe in him. And so in John chapter 10, he's, he's built a theological point that Jesus is the son of God. And this is evidenced by the miracles. And Jesus had some really intense interactions with the people of his day, the religious leaders, to the point where they were ready to kill him. So in John chapter 10, the story ends with Jesus doing some really incredible things, but they are trying to kill him. And so he kind of retreats away to a place outside of Jerusalem. And this is where we pick up the story in John chapter 11. Jesus is going to get some news that has changed the course of some people that are really, really important to him. So if you'll start off with me in John chapter 11, verse 1, um, here's, here's what happens. It says, now a certain man was sick. Lazarus, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. 
And we've, we've read about this this year, this woman named Mary who is so touched by Jesus. She takes a year's worth of wages and ointment and oil, and she anoints his feet, um, and she worships him. And Jesus had a very close relationship with not just these women, but also their brother, Lazarus. And it says, therefore, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. This family lives in Bethany. It's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. It's next to the Mountain of Olives. And the, the, this was important because Jesus would often travel to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, he would stop in this town called Bethany. Well, on one of his journeys, he ended up coming into contact with a family named Mary and Martha. And they had a brother named Lazarus. And he grew very close to this family. Now, Jesus was a single guy, right? He was unmarried. And what's really cool about this is that he could have relationships with women who were also single and not make it sexual because he viewed these women as sisters, sisters in the Lord, sisters in faith, in other words. And that's how we as Christian men are called to view women um, who, who are not, we're not married to. And isn't that interesting in our culture that now you have to put up barriers and roadblocks? You can't even have The word love here in the Greek is phileo love. It means to have brotherly affection. It's a very um, kind word for love. It means you have a very close, intense friendship or relationship. And that's the kind of relationship that Jesus has with Lazarus. But Lazarus isn't part of the 12 disciples. And so here's another interesting thing. You can have friends with people outside of the ministry. You can be close with people like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and people can become very near and dear to you, even though they're not a part of your ministry team or your mission field. And that's exactly what's going on here with Jesus. And they tell Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus, sick. Well, let's continue on with the story. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Well, hold on, that doesn't make sense. I mean, just imagine you got news that your best friend was sick in the hospital and was probably going to die, and you say, get to him later. <laughs> doesn't that seem kind of like mean-spirited? Maybe you don't really care about this person as much as what you say you do. Well, that's not what's going on here with Jesus. Jesus has not caused Lazarus' sickness. Jesus is not indifferent to Lazarus' sickness. Jesus is going to show, this is going to be on God's time, He said this in, this in this passage that we read, Jesus loved, and this is the word agape, it's the word for divine love, Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so his delaying is not being indifferent. His delaying is not being mean-spirited or hurtful. His delaying has a purpose that's at work. You know, when we talk about suffering, suffering is one of the best arguments for the existence of God in the sense that it has the strongest emotional attachment. People say, how could a good God allow so much suffering or so much evil? Now, in the mere cold, hard facts of the reality, in philosophers and theologians, they have rendered the problem of evil, the argument against the existence of God for suffering and evil, it's invalid. It doesn't hold up philosophically. But yet it has a very deep emotional pull in our own heart. I've been there. For those of you who have suffered, Maybe you're suffering right now, and you may be asking the question, God, how could you allow this to take place? If you really love me, if you really have this divine purpose for my life, why are you letting my best friend die and you're not doing anything about it? I've told God, God, I know you have the power. I know this isn't what you planned, as we talked about last week, for my friend or for this person in church or for these people in the community or these children. And if this isn't what you want and you have the power to change it, why aren't you doing anything about it? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever felt that kind of pain? Well, I can guarantee you that's exactly what's going on in the minds of Martha and Mary and even Lazarus as he lays sick on this, on this deathbed. But Jesus says this, 
this sickness is not unto death. This is not the end to his story. You know, one of the ways that we experience healing and we can cope with this idea of sickness and suffering is we have to look out at the future hope. When Jesus looked at Lazarus' situation, he knew it wasn't the end. And guess what? For those of us who are in Christ, death is not the end. Sickness would not have the ultimate claim on your life. Hopelessness and despair and nothingness is not the end of your story. And when we look at our own suffering and our own pain, we must put these things into perspective just like Jesus did. This death is not the end. There is something much, much more and greater to be revealed in us. And so Jesus is on a mission. And it says he stayed there two more days. And so he is on God's timing, not his own. And the whole point of this is for what? Here's what he says. That the Son of God may be glorified through it. That the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now here's an interesting question, right? I think personally myself, my philosophy on the problem of evil and suffering is that there is no such thing as unjust suffering. There is no such thing as purpose purposeless evil. God is working out his plan. He is permitting evil because he sees the big picture. And so as we work through this idea on the problem of suffering, here we have a very important point. Jesus says, this is going to happen, that God may glorify his son. And you know, that can be true for you and I. There can be situations and circumstances that the reason why God is permitting you to go through what you're going through is because he is working out his plan that he may receive glory. But we've got to be really careful here. We cannot make this idea or this presentation of the gospel in John chapter 11 as the standard or as the rule. Sometimes we get sick and we die because we live in a fallen world. And one of the reasons why we should be careful is simply because of this. If we don't have a purpose or a plan to our suffering, we may view God as indifferent. We may get frustrated with God because we, we ask this question, God, if I'm suffering for your glory, why aren't you doing anything about it? Why did you let my friend die? Why are you letting me experience this pain and you're not changing anything about it? And so we must be very careful to think that God always has an immediate purpose to our pain and our suffering because here's the reality. Sometimes God lets people die, doesn't he? God lets people get diseases. God lets people get hurt. And it's not always because God is going to bring a miracle back. But that's what he's doing in this story. And I think that's what we should all ultimately strive for. Even though God may not answer yes to my prayer, even though he may not give me a miracle, I'm going to choose to trust in him. I'm going to choose to give him the glory. Let's continue on with this story. We got these untimely deaths and these sufferings. It causes us to question God's love for us. We've understood so far that even though Jesus is delaying, he is not in denial or indifferent towards their pain. This was a plan to bring greater glory to God. And so in verse 7, we find this. Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and Judea. And here's what it says. Then after he said this to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, Lately, the Jews sought to stone you. In other words, are you out of your mind? <laughs> they are trying to kill you. Why do you want to go back to the place where they are trying to kill you? That doesn't make sense. How many of you would escape persecution from the Middle East and say, you know what? I think I'm going to go back. Uh, you'd be like, no, I almost died. It's not going to happen. But Jesus is on God's timing and not our own. But something else is at work here. And it's a real good encouragement for the ministry of Jesus. Look at what Jesus goes on to say. Are there not 12 hours in the day? And if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not on him. So he says, hey, let's go to Judea again. I'm going to carry out God's mission. And they say, well, you're going to die. They're trying to stone you. And Jesus responds with some type of ambiguous statement. Do you know what he's meaning by this? Why does Jesus come back with, well, look, there's 12 hours in a day, as long as it's light, I'm going to continue to work and I won't stumble. But when it's nighttime, you will stumble because the light isn't there. What is he trying to say? Here's what he's trying to say. If I follow God's plan, I can't lose. Do you really think the Jews are going to be able to overcome the plan of God for my life? Do you really think people who want to kill me and hurt me are going to be able to thwart God's plan in some way, shape, or form? And the answer is absolutely not. Jesus is saying this, as long as I'm still on God's plan and on God's time, nothing can stop me. 
And I find peace in that. I find peace in the fact that, yes, my life may end. Yes, I may experience suffering and hurt and pain, but I can't undo God's will and plan for my life. I'm not going to do something that's going to cause God to abandon me. I could walk away from him, sure. But God isn't going to let other people thwart his plan and change it. He is ultimately in control. And there's, there's assurance in that. It's the doctrine of assurance. That as long as I am faithful to God, he will be faithful to me. As long as I am faithful to him, he can't be faithless. He will save me, and I will trust in his plan. And so here, the disciples are expressing concern. Well, God, uh, Jesus, if you go back, they're going to kill you. And Jesus responds, I'm on God's time, and I'm on God's plan. And there's no amount of manpower can overthrow that and change it. And that's the encouragement that I want to give to you. Maybe you're not going through suffering, but you know someone is. Trust in God's plan. He is in control. If he has permitted it, I will choose to trust in him. Take that encouragement this morning. And so he says, let's go to Judea. He gives them this ambiguous statement. Now we know what that is. And he says, look, when night times come, uh, you will stumble, you will quit. And when nighttime does come, there will be a time to quit. We had these t-shirts in high school for basketball and football. And I accidentally, well, I didn't accidentally. I just threw on a t-shirt. I'm a teenage guy. Went to church, and I got up to serve the Lord's Supper. And you know what it said on the back? You can rest when you're dead. <laughs> Not too good of a shirt to wear when you're serving the Lord's Supper. But that's what Jesus is saying. I know, isn't that, isn't that really bad? You can rest when you're dead. Everybody's looking up to take the Lord's Supper, and that's all they see on the back of my shirt. It's terrible. Jesus is saying, look, there's going to be a time when I won't be here, and I will die, but that isn't this time. That is not today. And look, you're alive today. You're not dead. Some of you may be sick. Some of you may be discouraged. But as long as there is breath in you, keep on working for God, just like Jesus did. Picking up in verse 11, here's what it says. These things he said, and after he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I will go that way that I may wake him up. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. In other words, look, man, if he's sleeping, this is the best medicine you can possibly get. Do you know one of the most important things to your health is sleep? It is like the game changer. Getting rid of stress and anxiety, but also getting at least eight hours of sleep is probably one of the best things that you can do for your body. And so that's what the disciples are saying. Well, don't go wake him up. He needs medicine. He needs sleep. And look at what happens. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, and you know, I'm glad Jesus does this because sometimes I can be a really hard-headed person and I'm like, I have no idea what God is saying. And so he just tells them plainly. He says, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. This was common biblical language. They used this phrase, asleep, to refer to somebody that was dead, but the disciples weren't getting it. The uh, preacher at the last church that I was at, earlier on in his ministry, um, he told a story that's hilarious. Uh, he was watching somebody's three-year-old from the congregation. They needed help. Well, Doug had to go to a viewing where, you know, somebody has passed away, and so there, it's an open casket. And so Doug makes the wise decision to take this three-year-old with him to the viewing. <laughs> Really bad. Just, and he goes, look, at the end of this room, there's going to be somebody sleeping up in the casket. But, you know, don't worry about it. They're just taking a nap. It'll just be really quiet. And so he takes them in to the viewing, and he's holding them there. And the little boy gets scared. He says, Doug, he dead. He dead, Doug. He is dead. <laughs> this little three-year-old kid. Now, can you imagine that experience as somebody, like, you're in charge of somebody else's kid, and you take them to a viewing? I laughed so hard when Doug told that story. It's absolutely hilarious. But there's, there, in, in the biblical times, there, you know, they called somebody who was dead asleep. Uh, and so when we die, we're asleep. You know why? Because we're going to wake up one day. It's called the resurrection. And we're going to live forevermore when the night is over. Uh, the darkness is gone. We get to live forever with God. And so Jesus has to say things that are plain, just like that three-year-old. Look, he is dead. He is gone. But something great is getting ready to happen. You see, Jesus understood God's plan. And understanding God's plan brings perspective to death. Jesus says this sickness is not the end. It's not going to end in death. This isn't the end of his story. 
And you know what? For those of you who have lost loved ones who are in Christ, it is not the end of your story. Death doesn't have the final say on their life or on yours. You will see them again. They will sleep no longer. You will live with them again. They will not have any suffering. They will not have any diseases. And when you see that perspective of God's plan on our life, it brings perspective to death. There can be hope in death. There can be the glory of God through death. There can be purpose through death and through suffering. And that's what's on display here. God is at work. Death is not the end. And so Jesus says, look, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm glad that I wasn't there because I love Martha. I love Mary. I love Lazarus. And this is going to be for your benefit that I wasn't there to save him. You know why? I'm getting ready to prove that I am the son of, son of God, and I am going to give you evidence for it, evidential reasons. I'm going to give you something that you can always bank on that's going to change the entire course of history. I am going to perform the greatest miracle that has ever taken place in the history of the world. I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead that I may be glorified as the son of God according to God's plan and his purpose. That's what's at work here. And that's what's going to be on display. Verse 16. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So Thomas is like, look, this resurrection given by Jesus is going to put the final nail in Jesus' coffin. The Jewish leaders are already after him. They already want to kill him. And if he goes and he does something like this, they are definitely going to kill him. But here's what he says. If that's the path that Jesus is going to choose, I am going to follow. One of the most beautiful presentations of discipleship. Wherever Jesus goes, even unto death, I will follow. Look, when it comes to perspective on our pain and on death, we must follow the way of Jesus. And sometimes that means picking up a cross. Sometimes that means enduring suffering and pain at the hands of evil people. But there's something bigger at work here. God's plan is on the move. Now, Thomas, just for a little uh, fun information, Thomas is called a twin, and there could be one of two we reasons. Even he, Number one, he really looks like Jesus, and so he may be mistaken for somebody that looks like Jesus, or more likely, he actually has a brother, a twin brother. Regardless, Thomas has some really strong faith. If Jesus is going to die, let's go die with him. And so Thomas expresses the essence of a true disciple. And look at what takes place. It says in verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for how many days? Four. And, and I'm going to read the King James Version here in a second because it's my favorite. But here's what it says. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met uh, with him. But Mary was sitting in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Their mourning period was seven days. Day number one, they would bury the person because they didn't practice the same type of things that the Egyptians practiced. There was no embalming that took place. And so the stench would actually come very quickly. And so they would rub spices on the individual who had passed away. They would wrap them in cloths um, fairly tightly. And, and so they would place them in a tomb, and they would roll this stone over the tomb. And so here is Martha, and she comes out to meet Jesus, and she is absolutely devastated. Jesus, if you were there, this would not have happened. Maybe you've asked a similar question. God, if you really loved me, you wouldn't have let me got fired from my job. Or you would have answered my prayer to heal my child. Or you wouldn't have let my parent die in the way that they did. We've all felt those same frustrations if you've lost someone. But here is Martha expressing to them. But then notice what she says. She says this. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Even though you weren't here and you let my brother die, I still trust in you. Now this could be a, you know, secondary way of saying, look, if you want to bring him back, I know that you can do that, but that's on you. I'm not going to ask you directly. That could be something that's going on here. But this is a manifestation of faith. 
that Martha believed in Jesus as her Lord and her Savior. And she knew he had the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. But even if he didn't, she still chose to trust in him. Look, friends, when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, and you are not fearing any evil because God is with you, that is an act of faith. That is you choosing to trust in God, that even though he's not changing your circumstances, he can change how you go through your circumstances. He is with you. He has not abandoned you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. There's good news. This is not the end of your story. This is not the end of Lazarus' story. If you believe in me, you will live again. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked Martha that question. Let me ask you that question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that even though you may die physically, you will truly live and death will have no claim on your life? Do you want to believe that? Do you want that promise? If you do, you can obey the gospel. You can trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be baptized into Christ and follow him all the days of your life and accept this great gift of life, the Lord who is the resurrection and who is the life. Do you believe this? If you do, it changes death. It changes perspective on your pain. And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. What a great confession. We, you know, we take that confession anytime somebody decides they want to be baptized into Christ. We ask them this question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And they say, yes, I do. They confess that he is Lord. They confess their faith in him. And they place their trust in him. And this is the grand claim. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the life. This isn't the end to Lazarus' story. There's a greater plan that's at work here. And let me encourage you, believe it or not, there is a greater plan at work in your life. God is on the move. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear death or suffering or evil because God, you are with me. John continues the story in verse 28. He says this, and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come. He's calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and she came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but he was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and who were comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. It was a standard operating procedure for seven days. You would weep with the other person. You would mourn with those who mourn. And so they are by her side. They are weeping with her and mourning for her because she has lost her brother, the head of the household, the provider for the family. They lost a lot. And it says, when Mary came where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell down at her feet. Just like she did several years ago when she anointed his feet with oil, she fell down on his feet saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. It's the same thing that Martha had to say. God, if you were there, bad things wouldn't have happened. And that is a lie. You know how I know that's a lie? God himself permitted bad things to happen to the son Jesus, who was innocent, who was perfect. Unjust suffering in this life that served a greater purpose because God was at work and God was on the move. He says, my brother wouldn't have died if only you would have been there. And continuing on in verse 33, we find, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, look at this, and the Jews who came with her were weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He's not indifferent towards her suffering. He's not throwing his hands up. Ah, what a faithless coward. God is not indifferent towards your suffering. You know what the Stoics believe? The Stoic Greek philosopher said this, if you want to find healing from pain and suffering, remove your emotions. Get rid of the bad feelings, just apathy, don't care. That was the answer. That's not biblical Christianity. Jesus was groaning in his spirit. He was suffering with her. You know, when my father passed away, this is what people say, and they don't mean anything bad by it. Um, you know, I, I feel sorry for you, I'm sorry. And I, as a teenager, I kept asking the question, why would they apologize? Why would they say that they were sorry? They didn't do anything wrong. But 
and when you have somebody that comes up to encourage you that says, we're suffering with you. We're hurting with you. We're walking along through this valley of the shadow of death with you. That's the encouragement that we should receive and we should give. And so Jesus has groaned in the spirit. He was troubled and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And it says, Jesus wept. I talked to a guy at the last church that I was at. He was getting challenged at work, you know, as a Christian. You don't even know one single Bible verse. And the guy responded, yeah, I do. John chapter 11, Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. So if you want to memorize scripture, you'd be like, yeah, I memorize a Bible verse. Memorize this one, Jesus wept. Now this word for weeping, okay, it's not the same thing as groaning in the spirit or being troubled. It literally means to get angry. That's, that's the base idea of this word. It doesn't mean that he had sunken in sorrow and sadness and despair. It means that he was angry. I had a cousin of mine. Every time he would get upset or mad, he would cry. And so, you know, mad people usually, they get red in the face and they're ready, they're ready to go. But not my cousin. He would actually have tears. And tears would come when he was sad or angry or, or mad or whatever. And so there were a couple times, you know, we came from a small little kind of rough town in Zanesville, Ohio. And so, you know, we would get in fights and stuff as kids. And be, before he would get in fight with someone, he'd be crying. <laughs> Imagine, like, teenagers fighting each other and one's just weeping. And he's like, let's go. That's kind of how Jesus is. I personally don't think he's angry at Martha or Mary. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that that's true, even though some theologians debate this. Here's why I think Jesus is angry. He's angry at death. Remember what I said last week? Death is our enemy. Death is our enemy. He is angry at death. And so he's got this kind of passionate, angry, sad, and he is, he is angry at the enemy of death. And he's not going to settle for death having the, the final say on this man's life. And so here is Jesus asking, where did you lay Lazarus? And we find the response in verse 38. It was a cave, and a stone was laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. That's the KJV version. I love that one. He stinketh. You know, suffering stinks. Suffering stinks. It's been four days since he was put in the tomb. Look, by the time the message got to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, he was already dead. Two days had transpired. And so he waits two more days to go to where Lazarus is, and he's been dead for a total of four days. And Martha's like, look, do not roll that stone back. Have you ever smelled something dead on the highway? Yeah, this is much worse, okay? He stinketh. And so... She says, he's been dead for four days. He is dead, man. Don't open up that tomb. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Take away that stone. I don't care if he stinks. You're going to see God's glory on display. And it says, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. Prayer precedes the miracle. God, thank you for hearing my prayer. And now when he said these things, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Let me reenact this for you. Their entire body was wrapped, and poor Lazarus, he had to come out like this. <laughs> I mean, the poor guy, he just can't catch a break. First he gets sick, then he dies, and now he's got to do the little humiliating hop. And Jesus says, hey, look, go over there and unwrap his clothes, but place yourself in that situation of what you just saw. Jesus calls forth this stinky dead man who's wrapped in clothes, coming out of the grave to display the glory of God, that they may believe that he is God's son. And even though Jesus knows answering this prayer is going to be his own death, there's something greater at work here. God is at work. God is on the move. His plan is in motion, and there's nothing that can stop it. This is the content of saving faith. I will resurrect Lazarus. Romans 4, 17, 
when Paul talks about the kind of saving faith of Abraham, and he applies that same thing to us. You know what Abraham believes? Even if I kill my son Isaac, to whom the promise was given, I know that God can bring him back from the dead. You know, a lot of people that struggle with miracles, they fail to answer the first question. If God can create the entire universe out of nothing, resurrecting someone from the dead is child's play. That's no problem at all. If God can speak the world into existence, which evidence and science do back up, the universe came into existence at one point in time from nothing, then resurrecting somebody from the dead was nothing for God. It was nothing for Jesus. And so the person who had died was alive again. He says, loose him and let him go. And look at the reaction. This is what we'll end with. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things that Jesus did believed in him. Guys, death is not the end of your story. It is not the end of the story of your family members who have died in Christ. Your suffering does not have the final say. And my encouragement to you as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death is to try to find out, God, what is your plan? What is your purpose? Who can I comfort? How can I glorify you? I know that you're with me. I know that you're grieving and groaning with me because I suffer. God, let your plan be made known. Be at work. For those of you who aren't in Christ this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't given your life to Christ, you can have true resurrection, true life. You can be alive again, never to die anymore. If you're willing to place your faith and your trust in Jesus, if you're willing to confess, just like Martha, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know what the Christians did after their great confession and after their, their faith? They said, I am turning away from sin and I am going to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of my sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. And that's my encouragement that I want to give you this morning. If you do, don't, do not believe in Jesus, look at the evidence. Place your trust in him. Become alive again. And bring perspective to this idea of death and suffering 